The best part about having to go to my wife's office party was that I got a chance to give my challenger a good race. The worst part was that the faster I went, the faster I would get there. The meeting was at a cabin in the woods, and there was a nice 20-mile stretch of road leading up to it. No stop signs, no stoplights, no traffic. Just an open road waiting for the Dodge to do its thing. It also meant no gas stations or jiffy stores. Donna and I had been drifting apart since our daughters got married. I had hoped for the opposite, but it wasn't meant to be. Donna insisted that I accompany her to this ceremony, even though I made it clear I didn't want to go. She used to go alone. Donna liked to drink, but I didn't. Sometimes I drank beer. Also, she was a social butterfly and I was not. For the last year, I suspected she was having an affair. By this time, I didn't care anymore. I think that was one of the reasons we drifted apart. I was biding my time, just looking for a way out of an unpleasant relationship. I needed a way to end it. I have to admit that I was probably the reason my wife decided to look for greener pastures. I'm an odd kind of minimalist, so to speak. I grew up in a very poor family. My brothers and I had much less than most kids our age, by which I mean things like bicycles, toys, pets, fancy electronic gadgets and the like. It was almost like being Amish without religion. I wasn't stupid, and I fully understood how the normal world functioned, but I couldn't bring myself to accept it. I knew it was important to stay out of debt. It was important to pay bills, and it was prudent to put something aside for retirement. To live a comfortable life as a minimalist, you don't have to be a fanatic, but you do have to keep yourself in check. By allowing yourself a few indulgences, you can appear normal to most people. My biggest weakness was marriage and family. I had a really hard time finding a woman who I felt could tolerate my eccentricities and who could accept my uniqueness. Donna was from the same background as me and was used to living a modest lifestyle. She didn't embrace it the way I did, but she could tolerate it. The longer we were married, the more she seemed to come around. I mean, she became less frugal. I didn't like it. But I understood, especially after the girls were born. Not to be weird, we bought a small practical house and started wearing better clothes. Donna had her hair done from time to time and became quite adept at grooming and makeup. We got two smartphones from last year's models. As the girls got older, Donna started working. It was a minimum wage office job. Transportation was a necessity, so we bought her a small Honda Civic, just like mine. Her salary almost completely covered the cost of the car, lunches, and a new closet. My name is William Smith. It's the most common name a person can get. I work for a local company that makes industrial compressors. It's a very monotonous job, but I like it. I was happy with the position and the pay. Sometimes I was offered a promotion, but I turned it down. I never told Donna. My second affair, I kept it from my wife. I felt it was prudent to save for retirement. Every chance I got, I bought gold, one ounce of Krugerrand. I had more than 30 in my cellar safe and I was just getting started. Finally, I allowed myself a 1970 Dodge Challenger. Donna did a good job at Gilbert Industrial. She received regular bonuses and promotions. For the first year, she talked about her job quite a bit, but then that started to wane. Now she rarely mentions her job or the people she works with at all. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Tonight, I was hoping to get a better understanding of the situation. The party was something of an outing. It was a weekend event. I felt out of place for even going to it. I dated all of her companions at one time or another, and I didn't like any of them. We pulled off the highway in Holbrook, and I was finally able to let the Challenger accelerate. Donna was uncomfortable with the speed, but she held her tongue. Yes, I was speeding, but I didn't care. Bill, what's the rush? We've got plenty of time to get there. Why don't you slow down a little? I'm not anxious to get there. You know damn well I didn't want to go at all. I'm just using this time to clean the engine. A car needs a run now and then. Please try not to ruin my mood. This weekend is important for my career. Why? What do you mean? Why is it so important for me to attend this corporate event? I don't understand. Bill, you need to fully understand my new position in the company so you can give me the attention and support I need to do my job. 
I still don't understand. I'm sure Mrs. Simpson will be able to explain it to you when we get there. Marge Simpson was the wife of company president Glenn Robertson Simpson. It was old money and old business. I've always supported you in the past. What's changed? My new position has many unique responsibilities. Marge said you should gradually familiarize yourself with them so that you fully understand them. It may be difficult to understand at first, but she assured me that you will come to understand. By the time we got to the lodge, my adrenaline was going off the charts. It didn't take a genius to realize what Donna was trying to say. The weekend promised to be interesting. When we arrived, Donna entered the lodge, leaving me to carry the bags. I felt like I'd been put on the spot. Hey, nice wheels, Mr. Smith. That was Toby Wallace, the only decent worker in their office. Hello, Toby. How's it going? Toby introduced me to his wife, Bonnie. They were sitting on the front porch, but it seemed like everyone else was inside. I looked around the parking lot and estimated that there were about 16 cars and one shabby old truck at the end of the lot. For the next five minutes, we talked about the Challenger. What are you doing outside? Why aren't you and Bonnie inside with the others? They're not our kind of people, Mr. Smith. We were hoping to leave early, but Mrs. Simpson insists we stay. We came in early today to help set things up. All the vendors left about an hour ago. You'll have to explain yourself. What's going on? Something suspicious, but I don't know exactly what it is. I don't want to upset you, but I think it has something to do with your wife. Are you staying the whole weekend? No. That's why I parked my truck on the side of the road so I won't have to worry when we leave. This was getting more interesting by the minute. All right. I better get this stuff to our room. Let me know before you leave, okay? Sure, Mr. Smith, be careful. Don't do anything stupid. Fortunately, it was only two small bags. As I walked into the cabin, Mrs. Simpson caught my eye, smiled and waved. Donna was waiting for me at the top of the stairs and looked a little annoyed that it had taken me so long to get in. It's about time, Bill. We have a few hours to get ready for tonight. Get yourself cleaned up and put on something presentable. It's going to be a special night, and I want it to be perfect. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a little walk around the house to calm down. I'll be right back. I noticed I smirked as I left the room. There was a slight chill that made my walk a little more pleasant. By my count, there were indeed 16 cars. They were mostly Mercedes, a few Jaguars, and a Lexus. Four of the cars had out-of-state license plates. I was a little confused, trying to figure out how a woman in my wife's position could possibly match up with people of this caliber. She, or rather we, were definitely out of the level of these people. Something was not right. I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading their bags into the truck. I waved and walked over to chat. I see Mrs. Simpson has decided to let you go. Not quite. We're kind of slipping away. I'm not comfortable here, Mr. Smith. Toby thought maybe we should stay, but I talked him out of it, Bonnie added hastily. Could you do me a small favor and stay here until after the buffet tonight? I'm a little nervous, too, and I'd really appreciate it. I have no idea what's going on, but I don't like it. Great minds think alike, don't they, Bonnie? She blushed slightly at my pathetic attempt at humor. I think we can. There'll be crabs and oysters at this point. Toby, I think I'm gonna like it. I dressed as my wife insisted. Before we reached the buffet, the hostess took me under her arm and led me into a quiet alcove. We're so glad you decided to come tonight to support Donna. This is a big step in her career, and it's important that she has your full support. The pay and benefit increases are very significant, and I'm sure you will be pleased with that. Pardon me for asking, but what position are we talking about? Donna was a little evasive. When I ask her about it, she usually just waves me off and tells me to wait until tonight. It's okay, William. I think she just wants to surprise you. You didn't answer my question. There's no official name. I guess you could just say she's the personal assistant. I see. Well, the buffet looks good. Thank you for the explanation, Mrs. Simpson. Marge, please call me Marge. I spent the next hour or so trying everything on the line. Donna was busy socializing with important people, so Toby, Bonnie, and I were able to spend a little more time together. 
We were just packing up when Mrs. Simpson came in. William, Donna said you came by tonight in your sports car. I was wondering if you could take us out for a little run with a drink. I smiled and nodded. There are three cases of wine at the ABC store in Holbrook. They're already paid for, so all you have to do is come and pick them up. There shouldn't be any problems, but if there are, just give me a call. Make sure you bring your cell phone. I'd be happy to, Marge. I'll let Donna know and I'll be on my way. When she left, I looked at Toby. I'll meet you outside in five minutes. Donna only smiled when I informed her that Mrs. Simpson had asked me to help. Her only comment was, don't forget your phone. Interestingly, they both emphasized the same thing. Toby, I need a favor. He smiled as I tossed him the keys to the Challenger. Are you serious? Go to Holbrook and buy three cases of wine from the ABC store for Mrs. Simpson. I have a feeling there might be some kind of problem that will cause a delay, if you know what I mean. Toby smiled and nodded. Here's my cell phone. Just put it on the dashboard. If it rings, don't answer it. Whatever you do, don't turn it off. Questions? How long do you want us to stay away? At least two hours and fill up on gas before you head back. Enjoy it. It was a little chilly outside, but I had thoughtfully put on a comfortable jacket. Now all I had to do was wait and watch. From various spots on the back porch, I could see most of the inside of the cabin. A thermos of coffee would have come in handy, but I hadn't planned that ahead of time. I found a convenient spot from which I could look inside without being seen. Donna found herself the center of attention. She smiled, laughed, and embarrassed herself like a movie star. After about 20 minutes, Mrs. Simpson and Donna looked intently at Donna's cell phone. I knew exactly what they were doing, checking my location. Well, thanks to Toby, I'm almost to Holbrook. They both smiled as Mrs. Simpson raised her hand and began to speak. Unfortunately, I couldn't make out what was being said, but everyone in the room seemed to quietly approve of what they were hearing. It was like soft applause. Glenn Roberts and Simpson walked over and took Donna's hand. They started up the main staircase and stopped. He raised his and her hands up as in a victory salute, and they both laughed. As they climbed the stairs, I could hear cheers of joy in the room. It was about an hour and a half before the Challenger returned. I decided to take my time and enjoy myself. I always had with me my trusty penknife of good steel with a sharp blade. I looked around and decided I would start with the cars closest to the house. I was in no hurry. There was no hurry. I carefully placed each valve stem in my jacket pocket. I didn't want to lose anything and I didn't want to clog the driveway to the Simpson house. 16 cars and 64 valve stems. I had almost an hour left. What to do? What to do? Four of the cars were locked. All the others were unlocked, so I started again with the ones closest to the lodge and took down the registration sheets. Some were on the visors, but most were in the glove compartments. I had no idea what I was going to do with them, but I figured they might come in handy in the future. It was still 30 minutes until Toby got back. I decided that I needed to strip out the valve stems on the spare tires. Since I had access to the cars, I also had access to the trunks. After 20 minutes, I had 10 more valves. Two cars didn't have spare tires. I know it was petty and childish, but it gave me some mild satisfaction. I'm not a big fan of confrontation, so everything I did or intended to do was low and mean. I didn't have self-esteem issues, so I didn't feel the need to look manly or heroic. I'll let all the alpha males take on that role. 20 minutes later, the challenger returned. Toby and Bonnie seemed to be enjoying the ride. He confirmed that there was indeed a delay at the ABC store as I had expected, and it looked like it had been pre-planned. While they were gone, no one called my cell phone. I turned it off and pulled out my SIM card. They were anxious to get home soon. I thanked Toby, wished him a happy journey, and urged him to find another job as soon as possible. I'm sure the cases of wine were quite expensive. That problem was easily solved. I put all three crates on the porch of the gatehouse. In no way did I want to be accused of theft. The ride home was relaxing. 
There wasn't much in the house that was important to me. A few personal papers, a laptop, and the Krugerrands. At first, I was going to set the house on fire before I left, but that would have made Donna a martyr. I didn't want to do that. Two hours later, I was on my way. I didn't feel the need to leave the traditional note or wedding ring. Let her deal with it herself. I was in no hurry and had no purpose in mind. I had been on the road for two days. Monday morning, I called work and gave notice. I asked that my last check be sent to my parents in Carlisle. They were not happy that I left without warning. I apologized, but didn't bother explaining anything. You can always count on a good breakfast at Waffle House. On the way out, I bought the local merchandiser newspaper and found an interesting ad for a local supermarket needing help. They were looking for someone to load the shelves between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. After breakfast, I checked out the market. It was in an eclectic, old Chattanooga neighborhood. I spent the next hour driving around the neighborhood. There were many old craftsman cottages and a few mobile homes in the immediate area. I could have been happy in a small trailer, but was hoping to take it a step further. Then I happened to come across a sign offering to rent a garage apartment. I hadn't inquired about a job yet, but I didn't want to lose the garage apartment. The garage wasn't included in the price, but when I offered $50 a month more, they agreed. It was a small one-bedroom apartment with no shower. It was furnished with a bed, a dresser, a table, and chairs. The rent was okay, and the place was suitable, so I took it. I would solve the bathroom problem later. At least I had a garage for the challenger. The situation at the supermarket was a little different. They had plenty of challengers, but not so many that they felt comfortable leaving them alone in the store overnight. I explained my situation to the owner and spared no words. What finally secured the job for me was that I offered to work in the black, with no benefits and a dollar less than they wanted to pay. They didn't even ask for my social security number. I was happy, and they were happy. It was a ten-minute walk from the apartment. I spent the rest of the day getting settled into my new home. The landlord gave me an access code to his internet, which was nice. After a short trip to the local Goodwill, I had some kitchen supplies and a small microwave. I also had linens and cleaning supplies. That evening, I canceled my insurance policies. I decided not to mess with bank or credit cards. Little could they do any harm. Both of our daughters were married. That made my departure a little easier. No grandchildren yet, but I'm sure it won't take too long. I called my daughter, Lara, and let her know that I was okay. I asked her to be available to help her mother if needed. Lara knew I was gone, but Donna gave her no other information. She promised to break the news to her sister, Linda. I deleted all calls from my wife and turned my phone off again. I needed to take a shower, maybe tomorrow. Not everything was perfect. I needed to find a safe place for my gold. I know what I had wasn't considered essential, but it was important to me. For some strange reason, I got a safe deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama. I hoped that it wouldn't be linked to me in Chattanooga. Of course, I was completely wrong, but I wanted to at least try. The drive was almost two hours, but that's what I figured. The garage door at the apartment was pretty secure, but I installed a new deadbolt and heavy-duty lock just to make sure. I needed to be protected. It didn't take me long to settle into my new job. I had a man working with me the first three nights, and then they left me alone. After the first two weeks, I had everything under control. For $20 a month, I got a membership to the Planet Fitness Club, which solved my shower problem. I would start work at 10 at night and finish at 6. Next was a 20-minute jog or 30-minute walk to the planet. Initially, I only used the shower, but gradually I started using some exercise equipment. By the end of the first month, I was working out at the gym for almost two hours every day. I felt better and lost a little weight. I never considered myself heavy, but I was a little flabby. I was happy with my new job. It was monotonous, but also different. It's hard to explain, but I'm sure you'll see what I mean. I did my job and I was left alone. The gym was also a good choice. I decided which exercises I liked and which ones I should avoid. I didn't have a TV, but I had a used desktop computer with a good monitor. I didn't cook much, but I found that my eating habits had changed a bit. 
Although it wasn't my intention, I found myself drifting towards a keto diet. After three months, I felt better and lost weight. It was time to reach out to my daughters again. This time, I called Linda. Hi, Linda, it's your father. Well, it's about time. We've all been worried about you. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I've always been able to take care of myself. I'm just calling to make sure your mom's okay. My mom's doing great. She seems to have gotten a promotion at work and loves her job. She's really mad at you, though. She said you left her at the promotion celebration and then left the house like a hurt little boy. Those are the words she used. She said you were jealous of her success. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can add to that. Until she's ready to tell you the truth, that's all I have. She said things are tough without your income, but with her raise, she's doing fine. Well, I'm happy for her. Did she tell you anything about her new job? Just that she's making more money and traveling a lot? I didn't answer. After a short pause, Linda asked, Are you coming home for Christmas? I don't think so. I'll try to send something for you and Lara. We don't need anything, Dad. We'd rather have you here. I'm sorry. Now I gotta go. Say hi to Lara for me. Bye. I was feeling a little depressed. I felt like my daughters didn't understand the situation and thought I was the cause of all the problems. I wasn't happy about it, but I didn't feel obligated to explain myself. It was obvious that there was no remorse on my wife's part. I felt a little bitter. From what my daughter was saying, Donna was doing just fine without me. I didn't understand why she wanted me home. I spent the weekend dejected. My beer consumption was on the rise. As the weeks went by, I found that things were going well. I was doing a good job and received a promotion I had not expected. They gave me full discretion as to what my responsibilities were, and in a very short time I had streamlined and improved the restocking system. The store's general computer system was already doing this, but they seemed to appreciate the manual input. My accommodations were ideal for my situation and well within my budget. My weight went down and I began to build muscle. In the right light, I began to look skeptically at the six pack of cans. I stopped shaving and now had a full head of hair, long enough to make a small ponytail. My whole image seemed to have changed and I seemed a little scary. My workouts at the gym were getting easier and a little longer. An unexpected side effect was that I also made a few friends at the gym. They weren't really friends, but more like acquaintances. I was very careful with women because I didn't want any problems. With guys, it didn't matter. In fact, we regularly bantered with each other. However, one very unusual alliance emerged. Her name was Harry, or at least that's what everyone called her. She wasn't very friendly and rarely spoke to anyone. I turned out to be the exception. She went there every morning and worked out for at least two hours. It was an intense workout, not flashy yoga. I assumed she was about 45, sturdy looking and always wore sweatpants and a sweatshirt. All the other women showed off their bodies in tight latex and skimpy outfits, not Harry. I was the only male in the entire cage that she talked to or even looked at. I didn't encourage her, but I didn't chase her away by any means. To be honest, I was a little flattered. Several months went by and I still hadn't contacted my daughters or my wife. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I made several trips to Huntsville to add to my Krugerrand collection. Then things started to change. William, can I talk to you for a minute? This was not a normal conversation starter with Harry. She called me William when all the boys called me Bill. Come to think of it, she'd never called me by my first name before. Uh, sure. No problem. Is there anything I can do for you? As a matter of fact, there is. We sat down on a bench and made ourselves comfortable. I have a corporate meeting I have to attend Friday night and I need an escort. I'll cover all expenses and I just need you to come with me. I noticed that you don't drive, so I will also provide transportation. If necessary... I can reimburse the expenses, I stammered, and she quickly picked up on it. I'm really sorry. Did I do or say something wrong? No, not at all. It's just that I have a few skeletons in my closet, so to speak. If you can get around them, I'd be happy to help. All right. What are the problems? First of all, I'm married. 
Oh, damn, you never mentioned a wife. I think that's weird. No, not at all. I just wanted you to know in advance. I haven't seen or spoken to my wife in over nine months. I don't even know if I'm still married. Did you file for separation or divorce? No. What else? I don't have anything appropriate. No suit, no jacket, no shirt, no regular shoes. I don't need any of that stuff, so I don't have it. No problem. I can take care of it. That's why I'm asking in a week. I do work nights, but I think I can get a free night with no problem. I'm glad you're going to solve this problem. She smiled when she said that. What else is there? Do you want me to shave? William, I like your beard and hair, but frankly, you're a little scruffy. Would you mind if I had my stylist take a look at you Friday afternoon? A stylist? She smiled and I groaned and nodded that it was okay. Thus began my relationship with Harry, professionally known as Harriet Parker, attorney at law. On Tuesday, I found myself at Jose Banks, not a super first-class establishment, but a notch above anything I'd ever been to. Harry had arranged my visit in advance. I ended up getting two pairs of pants and two sports jackets, a couple of shirts and some ties. I tensed up a little as I added two turtleneck shirts to the pile. I always liked them and thought they would look good with sport coats. Harry had already paid for everything. On the way home, I grabbed a new pair of decent shoes and some underwear. I needed new underwear because of my recent weight loss. The shoes were moccasin style, but still cool. My visit to the stylist on Friday went well. The guy who took care of me was easy to get along with and did a good job. He left me with a short, neatly trimmed beard and turned my ponytail into a sort of short, modified mullet. I don't know the actual term, but it was long in the back. He assured me it would be much easier to maintain. I liked it. He didn't talk much about Harry, but said I was lucky. Harry showed up at the apartment at six sharp. She didn't get out of the car, but gave a short squeak. The Lexus looked out of place in my neighborhood. I wore a gray jacket and a gray turtleneck. I thought I looked pretty good, but I had no point of reference. I was thankful she was driving because I didn't know the roads in town. Harry, before we go in, could you explain exactly what I should do or not do tonight? The first hour or so will probably be socializing. You don't need to get worked up about it. Most people here are going to be big sensual snobs that you don't want anything to do with. Avoid them if you can. Most importantly, I want you to stay close to me and keep the snobs away. Try to keep out of sight, but don't let anyone push you around. Make sure I always have a drink in my hand. Ginger ale or mineral water. Be friendly and pleasant and don't lose your cool. Let them think we're a couple. I never thought of myself as that kind of guy. I don't have much experience in this kind of thing. Can you handle it? You bet. Will they feed us? In about an hour, we'll each get a plate of dollar five hundred rubber chicken and a few speeches. When that's over, they'll give us something else. You look good, by the way. It was at this point that I realized I hadn't complimented her on her dress or her hair. I was really out of my element. The first part of the evening went exactly as she explained. I found that my role was easier than I had expected. The room was full of single men, all wearing expensive suits and carrying large watches. Harry was really good looking, and most of them knew she was single. Quite a few of them took the time to stop by and have a little chat with her. They were testing the waters, so to speak. I caught myself throwing slanted glances at them like Charles Bronson, Surprisingly, it worked. Every time I stepped away from her to refresh her drink, another vulture swooped in. Some of them brought her drinks, which she calmly handed to me to dispose of. Harry glanced at me a couple times and sort of smiled. Finally, we sat down. 300 chicken lunches came out of nowhere. It was a pathetic plate. I'm not what you'd call a picky eater, but this was different. I kept thinking about the $500. Harry leaned over to me. William, do you want to leave this place? I didn't answer her. I just stood up, took her hand, and we left quietly. I don't think anyone even noticed. When we entered the garage, she dropped her shoes and tossed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us some real food, William. Twenty minutes later, we were already at Village Willie's. We each had a full plate and a glass of beer. As we ate, 
I noticed one unusual thing. Her evening gown had long sleeves. Most women's dresses had short sleeves or no sleeves at all. Also, she was barefoot, and it didn't seem to bother her at all. Things quickly returned to normal. My evening with Harry was pleasant, though it didn't end in any intimacy. We continued our usual relationship at the gym. Three weeks later, Harry had another appointment that required an escort. I, of course, agreed. I felt obliged to explain the situation to my boss, and he found it quite amusing. Under the circumstances, he told me that there would be no need to ask for permission to take a vacation. Just leave him a note. He more or less told me that I was responsible for my own time and should treat it accordingly. Harry's daily workouts at the gym were pretty tough. Her heart was beating faster and she was sweating a little. She was always fully clothed. Most of the females at the gym wore sports bras and shorts. Harry wore sweatshirts and long pants. It didn't make any sense, but I wasn't going to bring it up. Our second night was similar to the first, except there was no food and there was more booze. More booze meant more lizards snooping around. Every other guy who approached brought a fresh drink. Most of the evening I was busy collecting and disposing of unwanted glasses. One of the more obnoxious guys finally got to me. I took him aside and quietly told him that if he ever harassed my fiancé again, I would clean his face. He disappeared for the rest of the evening like so many other scumbags. I didn't realize I'd become so formidable. After the meeting, we went out for sushi, but ended up eating $40 worth of sashimi. It was another fun, platonic evening. Two days later, Harry caught me off guard while I was rowing. Why didn't you tell me we were engaged? I was a little embarrassed when one of my co-workers asked me that. She didn't wait for an answer, but smiled. I called Lara. She said that Donna had been avoiding her and Linda. All Lara knew was that Donna traveled a lot and that people stayed at the house regularly. I asked her if her mother had filed for divorce, but she had no idea. It had been several weeks since she and Linda had been in contact with Donna. For some reason, I got angry. The more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next morning, I mailed 74 valve stems to Glenn Simpson at Gilbert Industries. I included a short note. Thanks for a fun evening. It had been over a year since that party, but I was sure he remembered it. I skipped the gym that day. I didn't want to work out with a hangover. The next day, I got a compulsion from Harry. I promised to explain everything to her the next time we had dinner together. She picked me up at six in the evening. Harry took me to Chris's steakhouse. It was my first time at a place like that. She listened silently and made no judgments. I got back to my apartment just in time for the start of my work shift. The next day at the gym, Harry asked me another question. Do I know anyone who was at the cabin that night? When I told her I had the names and addresses of everyone who was there, her eyes lit up. After our training session, she stopped by my house and I gave her an envelope with 12 car registration sheets. She grabbed them and kissed me on the cheek. There are many kinds of lawyers. Harry was a personal injury lawyer. She tried to explain it to me, but I just smiled and asked what it would cost me. All I got in response was another kiss on the cheek. Three days later, I got a call from my daughter, Linda. Donna had called her to see if she knew where I was. There was some kind of problem at Donna's workplace, and she was in the middle of it. She was not happy and wanted to talk to me immediately. Linda refused to tell her anything. I wonder if Glenn got those valve stems. I called Harry and told him I would pick her up in 20 minutes. Her office was in an upscale shopping center. It was nice, but not too flashy. Harry had never seen a Challenger before. The sound of the engine caused a few curious gawkers from her office as she walked out to the car. I walked around the car to open the door for her and smiled at all the gawkers. Harry laughed as she got into the car. Well played, William. Well played. I suppose you'll want an engagement ring now? In due time. Take your time. I kept the Challenger under control until we crossed the Tennessee River. Then I started to accelerate a little bit. Highway 72 leading into Huntsville is a good stretch of road, but not the best place to show off. Two hours later, we were already sitting in dreamland. William, 
All the people who were at the cabin that night have been served today. What do you mean, served? It's a lawsuit. The actual term is malicious behavior contributing to the deterioration of a marriage. Does such a thing really exist? It appears that all the necessary categories have been met. Their behavior was intentional, it was extreme, and it caused you severe emotional distress. That must be why my wife was upset. What do you mean your wife was upset? My daughter Linda called me today and said Donna needed to talk to me. There was a big problem at work and somehow she was involved in it. I don't know anything else. Glenn Simpson and Gilbert Industries are being sued for a million dollars. The other 11 are being sued for a hundred thousand each. I'm not trying to be a smart ass or anything, but do you really think this is going to work? Of course it will. It may not be as easy as it sounds, but I think some interesting things could happen. As we left the restaurant, I was a little nervous, so I nonchalantly asked Harry if she wanted to get a room and come back in the morning. I'd like to, but I can't. If you want, we can leave early. That's not the point. Let's just go. I'll explain everything to you on the way home. The car was quiet for the first 20 minutes, and then it started to open. It seems that eight years ago, Harry weighed almost 300 pounds. She decided to go on a diet and exercise rather than have bypass surgery. She lost 140 pounds. Unfortunately, she suffered from 20 pounds of loose skin. It took five surgeries to remove the excess flesh, and now she is left with scars all over her body. Harry is a brave, outspoken woman, but she admitted to being very self-conscious about her scars. She avoided dating and any contact with her male friends. For some reason, she felt comfortable with me, but she didn't know why. I dropped her off at her house, walked her to the door, and kissed her lightly on the cheek. She thanked me for the food, and as I left, there was a small tear in her eye. We continued our platonic dating. We both seemed content with it. Nick Jack's markets seemed to be popular with the locals. They had added two more stores in less than two years and had no intention of stopping. The owners were serious when they offered me a full-time position as inventory manager for all three units. However, they insisted that I become a permanent employee, which meant I had to be fully legalized. At this point, it didn't matter anymore, so I agreed. Harry was happy, and so was I. A few more weeks went by. I didn't hear from my daughters for quite a while, and then I got a quick text. Mom got fired! That made things a little more complicated. I now had a full-time job with a decent paycheck, and Donna was no longer working. At this point, I was afraid that I would end up being penalized in the divorce. William, I have some good news for a change. Harry was serious, and I turned all ears. Three of the 11 people we sued have settled. What does that mean? Because we only sued for $100,000, the insurance companies advised them to just pay up and avoid a public lawsuit. It was covered by their insurance, so it wasn't a big loss to them. You mean we could get some money? William, I've already received three checks. There'll probably be more. You think this has something to do with Donna getting fired? Yes, of course it does. Is this gonna screw up my divorce? Have you filed the papers yet? No, not yet. I was going to ask you to help me with that. Harry smiled. William, pack a small bag and get the challenger ready. We're going to go and visit your wife. We'll leave early Thursday morning. Now I was smiling. We left at six in the morning and checked into the Sheraton Hotel ten hours later. I called Linda and asked her to take Donna and Lara to lunch at the Reading Motor Inn the next day. The conversation over dinner was somewhat awkward. Our conversation was varied and confusing. Why? We were both careful to avoid the elephant in the room. We had spent our first night together. For over a year, we'd been friends without benefits. The last thing I wanted was for her to feel uncomfortable. While I won't go into the details of the evening, I will say that it was nowhere near as traumatic as we expected. We were both a little rusty, but managed to get through it with good results. She seemed relieved that I wasn't disgusted, and I was happy that it wasn't as bad as she made me think it was. We were a couple of happy fools.
In the morning, we had a late breakfast. Donna and the girls were already waiting for us at the table. I was wearing one of my new sport coats with a dark turtleneck. I looked good. Harry was wearing one of her light business suits, sort of casual professional. My wife and daughters looked at me in amazement. Donna, Linda, Lara, this is Harriet Parker, my confidant and attorney. Harriet, my wife, Donna, and daughters, Linda and Lara. It was awkward, but the best I could do. Before we could devolve into meaningless chatter, the waiter showed up to take our order. I'm not hungry. If you don't mind, I'll just have a coffee. Donna was the first to break the silence. I quickly looked around the table and came to the same conclusion. Why don't you just bring us five cups of coffee and leave the coffee pot on the table? The waiter nodded and everyone seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. It's good to see you again, Bill. Could you tell us about what you've been up to the last few years? Donna smirked slightly as she said this, just working and giving you the freedom to find yourself or whatever it is you do. Harry kicked me lightly under the table. I needed you, and you left me. Maybe you needed someone, but not me. Mom, Dad, drop it. I'm sure you didn't set up this meeting to sit around and tease each other. Dad, why are we here? Linda was very persistent. I could see that this was going to be a very short meeting. I was at a loss. I glanced at Harry, looking for any hint on how to move forward. She ignored me, but took over the conversation. Harry reached into her purse and pulled out an envelope. She held it out across the table to Donna. Mrs. Smith, this is a divorce petition. I think you'll find it very fair. I suggest that you take it to your attorney and have him look it over. Lara and Linda looked astonished. It was clear they hadn't expected this. Donna, however, was smiling broadly. She didn't take the envelope from Harry, but reached in and pulled one out of her purse. You stupid asshole. I divorced your weak ass eight months ago for desertion. You never got a copy because I didn't know where to send it. That's final. Anyway, you don't have anything I have a claim to. Her smile turned into a wide grin. The waiter returned with our coffee and a full table vase just as Donna stood up. She smiled at Harry and I and gave the girls a strange look before walking away. She left both envelopes on the table. Dad, can we stay for lunch? I heard they have really good custard pie here, Lara asked. Harry and I laughed and asked the waiter to bring the menu. Harry, Lara, and Linda had a great lunch and talked. I felt like I was eating alone. I never understood women too well. The girls exchanged phone numbers and promised to keep in touch. Back in my room, I started packing. William, I thought we were staying one more night. Yeah, but not here. Hurry up and get packed. An hour and 30 minutes later, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Another 30 minutes later, Harriet Parker turned into Harry Smith. We spent the night in Lure, Virginia. We have a house with a three-car garage. That's another story. The girl said Donna had a seizure when she found out I received over $2 million from Gilbert Industries. Donna moved to Iowa. I don't know why. 